first of all, hey, how are you doing? It's, it's nice to man. see you in digital yeah. form. Um, I just I just saw you uh, have Mina on your show. Are you somebody who feels energy depleted after doing podcasting, or do you feel energized? Kind of in the way that you know people would say Bill Clinton would draw energy off glad handing and meeting people. But Obama, more professorial, more of an introvert, you know, and after some big glad, glad handy event would just feel, oh, my God, I just need to get my energy back up. Where are now, you? I just feel like I talked to somebody on the phone for an hour. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it's a little it's a little different when it's a podcast that somebody else is on, you know, because once that mm. happens, is it's a conversation. An hour yeah. by myself, that just takes a measure of energy. Like, I don't think that mm -hmm. there's anybody that's going to do an hour by themselves and feel well, like you got to be like really in love with the sound of your own voice to do that and then feel energized at the point at which you finish. Uh, but that one got it done, had lunch, chilled out for a second, jumped over here. You know, I guess I feel like I've been doing this for so long that there ain't been so many ups and downs on that. Mm. But if I had to do that glad handed thing, no, I don't feel better after <laughs> having done that. No. <laughs> I feel exhausted after a podcast. I shouldn't reveal that to people because I think people want to feel like you are maximally energized. They like that uh, that sort of Pat McAfee sense where you're just you're you're a ball of energy. But the truth is, we are having a conversation right now. Maybe we've started the podcast already and you're listening to it, but I'm kind of on, right? Like I have to be somewhat vigilant. It's not like we're just hanging out. And so when it ends, there is this sense of whoo that kind of like i'm no longer on which i think you've been doing it so long that you don't really have that you, yeah. you're a little bit more yeah well i think the thing that i realized and where the difference is so after shooting like when i did the show for hbo like you shoot an episode of game theory and that took about 45 minutes to an hour give or take after that was done i was done Right. Like, mm. like, and I think that that had more to do with all the preparation that goes into it. And so the show itself becomes more of a culmination. Um, the podcast, for me, at least not that I don't think about it, but it's a bit more of a, OK, we're going to get this done, bang it out. Cool. Then we go. So I think it's a little less build up on the front end for me. So it then winds up being less exhausted on the back. Yeah. Well, let's let's start this. Let's start this podcast here. It's House of Strauss. It's Bomani Jones, the most requested of all the guests. <laughs> and maybe we'll start with that. We'll start with should I have revealed that you are the guy who drives the most subscriptions? I feel like I should have I should have kept that one under my hat. And it's a little strange to reveal that you are the guy that people want to sub to. And and what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on you and your popularity, Bomani? Well, I think what you are describing there, I think that was a very important thing, which is I don't really inspire but so much ambivalence, um, <laughs> which I find to be odd because I think I'm a pretty measured fellow when it really comes down to it. Like, I don't I don't I don't really think I'm that incendiary or inflammatory or fiery with my rhetoric. That, you know, that's just the way that I see it. But I'm probably going to be a person that if you fuck with me, you fuck with me heavy. And if you don't, like, there's no difference between people who don't care about you and people who hate you, in effect, in this mm. business. Like, pe people operate on the assumption that as long as somebody's talking about you, it's all a win. And that's not really it. Because what we got, at least in the current time, is a lot of people who know how to get folks to talk about them, but can't get people, I mean, I don't mean to sound too crass or cynical about this, but can't get people to spend any money. So if mm. they had to sell any tickets or something for the product that they offer, they can't get anybody to do that. Those are the people that kind of struggle to survive in this. Like what I do think is important for anybody, especially if you're trying to operate on any level of like an independent platform or whatever, you're going to have to be able to sell stuff along with whatever your existence is. Like you can't just have um, social accounts with a bunch of people that follow them because it costs nothing to follow somebody like all these people found this out when they tried to book all these concerts for these people that had these massive social media followers and they couldn't sell any fucking tickets because they didn't have anything that anybody like really wanted to rock with or pay for. So I did appreciate you reminding some people who, I mean, honestly, listen to the word of bad faith actors and just to simply remind them that, no, 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 actually, there are there's a non insignificant amount of people who care about what I say and are willing to invest in it to hear it because they believe I believe it. This is me, perhaps assuming too much. I believe they appreciate the respect that I have for the people who listen to what I say. And that if you demonstrate that you respect them in that way with your with your takes in the way that you comport yourself, 
then yeah, people will consume your content in a regular way as opposed to just every now and then. Yeah, and it does superficially look like all the same thing, which is why it's an interesting topic to me. Your popularity, your renown looks exactly the same superficially to somebody who cannot drive subscriptions, who cannot compel payment. And it's a funny thing. I, I put it out there because, well, there were a few things happening. People were debating your value and I felt a certain strange, like ethical responsibility to say, because I had this, um, not dramatic irony, but I had this knowledge that, hey, this guy, I mean, people, people want to hear from this guy. And I felt as though it was worth saying so and demonstrating, but it also to me felt like a good topic for my website because it is a strange time that we live in where someone who like they, they look like they have equivalent popularity, but one person's popularity might be a mile wide and an inch deep versus another person where it's actually quite deep. And in this new media ecosystem, which can be more subscription driven, I mean, that's that's not an insignificant difference. It matters. Yeah. And I think. Like if I were to look at my path on this, and I don't know if I would say if I found anything that could be um, illustrative or that's something that somebody else can pick up from is that I had started doing a lot of what I would call this branding on my own for uh, more than five, probably fewer than 10 years before the social media machine really started humming. Because I look at like the year 2009 mm -hmm. as the year that Twitter really like turned into a thing and people really started using it to push the stuff they were doing and it started to take the form that it exists now. You went by, you went past the early adopters, right? And then that was the year yeah. where I felt like everybody else showed up to the party and then it kind of formed into what it is. But up until that point, like I'd been running websites and emailing links to people and all of this. And I was developing a brand that was a very intimate one. Like I knew the, the people who followed me closely before, call it 2010 or 2011, a lot of them feel like they know me and a lot of that lot actually does, right? Like it was mm, small yeah. enough that I knew those people. Like you look at somebody like Jim Rome, who was a great example. Jim Rome got it by having a very intimate relationship with his audience and he, he developed that intimacy on the road, really, by traveling, going to the cities mm. where those people were. And so, like, when he goes to, like, if you talk to him about it, like, the cities that really got on board with him early, Houston being a great example. He's going to Houston, and I guarantee you, a significant number of people that will show up at a Jim Rome event in Houston, he actually knows those people. And so, mm. once you do that, you can talk to the people that you are communicating with with a greater intimacy. And then all the new people who show up hear you speaking with this intimacy, and then they kind of feel that sort of relationship and it goes from there. And so the number of people that follow me on whatever the thing is doesn't really matter. Like I just looked up and I think like 100,000 people follow me on Instagram now. That's not an intimate audience, right? Mm. I got, um, I guess now it's like 570 something thousand people follow me on Twitter. That number has basically been static now for years. But I always yeah. made the point that my Twitter follower number was higher than the, it meant more than the average person's because I was asking so much of my Twitter followers, especially years ago when I would bombard them with content. If you decided mm -hmm. you wanted to stick around under that storm of shit that I was sending out, then you really, <laughs> really cared, right? That means mm -hmm. something different than the million followers insert like singer here has on Twitter where they don't actually send out any content. It's not costing you anything. You just follow them or somebody who just puts up cute pictures, right? And so <laughs> he or she puts up cute pictures. You follow because you like to have cute pictures in your timeline, but that don't mean you're going to spend no money on it. You know what I mean? Like that doesn't, that yeah. doesn't imply that you're really invested in whoever that person is. And so I've been lucky in the way that I've done this, that I've got a very loyal set of people who primarily consume the stuff I do. And then after that, I mean, like contrary to popular belief, um, I've been pretty successful and I always think stop that. Cause it ain't popular belief, right? Like I say that, <laughs> yeah, no, but I say that in like a self deprecating way, but I don't even want to give that necessarily oxygen. Like I've been part of some pretty important things with some pretty important people. And so a lot of people have picked up on what I'm doing and they stuck around over the years and can't everybody say that. It's interesting what you said about if this group of people can withstand the avalanche of content that it's almost like this selection pressure for people who are really going to, um, be uh just be with you no matter what i feel similarly where sometimes people say are you worried that you're going to alienate this or that 
group of people by what you say. And I've got this sense of, well, I want to be honest with my audience because then they will be truly my people. Right. Um, and I don't want to be caught in that audience capture where suddenly I'm just saying things. I'm just saying things to project a certain image. And then you get caught in this weird this weird zone where you become this fraud to all the people you're communicating with. And, you know, what do you do? Either you have to, I guess, change your personality or just fear that your true self will be found out one day. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a crazy business we're in, Bomani. It's a very strange yeah. one. I also don't think people are nearly as sensitive as advertised, right? Like you oh, hear yeah. all that noise yeah. when you say the thing and I have lost respect for you and people lose <laughs> this and da, da, da and all that stuff, man. They're going to wind up back because everybody going to say something that they don't like at some point. And quietly, yeah. and nobody really talks about this, we all know who the panderers are, right? We all mm. know the people who are trying not to offend anybody when they say something or have a particular group that they don't want to offend. And even the people who are really on those teams, they see through that. And they know that yes. it's ridiculous, right? Like, everybody knows the score on this, man. Honestly, I still, you'll just never convince me that honesty ain't going to be the win and play. Yeah. Oh, it definitely. Um, I mean, maybe you could say that I'm an idealist for thinking that, but I think people can just get a sense of you and your personality when you're communicating in this particular format and they like falseness rings hollow. You know, it's almost you can just you can just sense it. So, no, I think um, I, I didn't plan on starting off with this. I, I actually planned on uh, it turns out that my guest acquisition strategy, Bomani, is writing something that pisses uh, favored guests off and uh, <laughs> they reach out and they text me and it starts a conversation. And then I I, I, I uh, turn that into a booking, which is where we're at. I feel like you were, uh, you were repulsed, maybe not repulsed, maybe mildly annoyed by whatever I was saying about Brock Purdy and Jordan Love. And I feel like that could be a good jumping off point to us talking about quarterbacks and some of this football that's happening yes. up into the uh, championship weekend. It was funny as you were going to say mildly annoyed. My thought was, no, nah, I was just a little bit annoyed. Annoyed was, <laughs> annoyed. you know, cause I've, I've kind of, uh, I have enjoyed in large measure, your little contrarian jaunt that you have jumped into in uh, the world of all of, of independent uh, sub stack and journalism. Right. Like I think I, and that's a compliment, contrarian. Yes. I wear it as a compliment, sir. <laughs> yeah, but continue. Yeah, no, no, no. But well, well, I mean it in the sense that I think that overall, and the, I say this as somebody who now has known you for what I would, con you know, contend to be a long time, and I, I feel comfortable saying no, right? Like I don't know you like your wife knows you, but we've talked about <laughs> enough things that I can say that I know you, right? Yeah. Um, I think that in large part what you've done with this that I find to be interesting and why I consume it is I don't think that there is nearly enough what I would consider to be intra-group disagreement. Um, mm. And I think knowing the sensibilities that you and I share, um, that a lot of the critique and criticism that you've had to offer is important because it is intra-group criticism that people don't feel like they can do in public because they kind of feel like they're undercutting their own side in the perpetual war against the other. Um, and I think mm -hmm. that across the board, like I don't think there's any one side of the aisle that is more guilty of this than the other, right? Like I think that this is an across the board mm -hmm. thing, but in the places where we share sensibilities, I think it becomes a little bit more important, or at least it, like, it matters to me in a different sort of way when you get some of those checks and balances put in place that are there. Okay, cool. The problem, of course, with this, as you and I have discussed, is that that occasionally leaves you on the same side on some issues with some people that I think are fucking morons. Now, I don't know <laughs> if it's the people like Brock Purdy. Is this? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. We'll, 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 get, we'll get to Brock Purdy, right? And not even necessarily, not even, fucking morons is unfair because some of them mm. may be bright, but I do think and from time to time it's kind of like, like you, you know, you mess around and get up and boy with some people that had people hitting me and be like, "Yo, I thought you said Ethan was your boy," and I'm like, "Shit, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. I, I know why you would now suddenly have questions of me." But I <laughs> largely believe that it is in a true and legitimate, what I would term like pursuit of truth, or at least of honest discussion and discourse. And mm -hmm. that is why I greatly enjoy and I pay you money and all of these things. Right, I'm there with you, but. I saw in the thing that you wrote about Brock Purdy versus Jordan Love, 
And it was something about the Brock Purdy part. And you made reference to the hive mind of the people who are critical of Brock Purdy. And I was just like, oh, come on, man. I feel like I feel like we speaking. I feel like you are speaking the language of the dick beaters. Right. Mm. And, I, and when I say the dick beaters, I want to make a very important point. Like the world, <laughs> these dudes out here who don't have that much sex are making the world a much worse place. Like you really go and look at it. The, the incels on down. They, they make And so when I started. Uh, wait, I started, wait, wait, wait. It, they're connected to Brock Purdy. Like, nah, I I'm, need saying, to get... I'm saying I'm saying why I use the phrase <laughs> dick beaters there is mm. those people there who, you know, dick beaters being shorthand for those people that I described. That's the kind of stuff they say about everybody else, right? Everybody else got the hive mind. Nobody ever is like, yes, me and my team, we a hive, and we all think the same mm. way. It's always the people that we disagree with that are all just saying the same stuff, right? And yeah. so with Purdy, I actually think, and I thought about this in briefly reading some of the thing that you wrote about uh, Nick Wright and Freddie. How do you pronounce his last name? Is it DeBoer? Fred, DeBoer, yep. DeBoer, DeBoer. okay. Yep. Um, and you made a reference to the fact that Nick's a poker player and he holds on to his Bayesian priors, which I had never really thought about it in that kind. Con- and, and as somebody, I know Nick very well. Um, and that is a great way to talk about him because one thing about him is he ain't backing off, right? Like once he has yeah. gone in on the take, he's not backing off until he absolutely cannot. He's got to believe. It was like once that prior's locked in, he's sticking to it and he's going and he's going and he's going. And I think with Purdy, it is very easy for people to make the assumption that the reason people have a skepticism of him is because he was the last pick in the draft that year, and they won't let go of the fact that he was the last pick in the draft. I think that there's actually a collinearity at play, and the reality of it is it's less about holding on to him being the last pick in the draft than the things that make you skeptical are also the reasons why he was the last pick in the draft. Right. Mm. So if you're talking about somebody that's a first round pick, we'll use Josh Allen as an example. Now, I think the way that people held out hope for Josh Allen went well beyond anything that was reasonable and based on what they saw on the field. But it cashed out. But if you want to make the argument that you hold on for three years to see if Josh Allen can do it, why? Because look at that big old strong ox who can run and throw the ball a million (laughs) miles. Yeah, you think that there's, there's more likelihood that that thing could turn around. The things that you think limit somebody or would make them the last pick in the draft. And those limitations were real. And so I think that people look at Purdy and they see those limitations. And on top of that, they seen Jimmy Garoppolo achieve very similar things in the same offense. It makes you raise questions as to how good he is. Now, perhaps the better question is how good does he have to be? How much does it matter how good he is within the context of what's being done? But it's not a strict bottom line thing. Purdy is not going to perform his way out of the skepticism unless he has a great game in the Super Bowl. Jalen Hurts is a great example. So for me, he could not perform himself out of my skepticism of him until he Mm. wrecked shop in the Super Bowl. And then guess what? He came out here not looking very good this year. Now, did he? And I should have been like Nick and maybe just never backed off my take in the first place. Mm. But that's the thing that I think is happening with Purdy is that the numbers are so good. And if he had won MVP, I mean, if he does, I mean, he's not going to, but let's just say yeah. he does. The vote hasn't come in. Yo, man, if you're averaging damn near 10 yards, 10 yards in attempt and you win the MVP, I just can't argue with that, right? I can yeah. think everything I thought about you otherwise, but if you're the MVP, then damn it, you're just the MVP. That happens. But this dude, I don't think that there's any larger campaign against him. I think there are a lot of people that really work so hard because – they reduce quarterbacking to a bottom line wins and losses sort of situation that they really want him to be good the same way they really wanted Jimmy Garoppolo to be good. And that motherfucker wants through an interception in the Super Bowl with his eyes closed. His eyes <laughs> were literally closed and he threw the football. You know what I mean? And so I was kind of like, hey, man, we might be missing the plot here. There's no I don't think the way that we deal with Brock Purdy is reflective of anything larger about the sporting discourse. I think that the way we talk about him combines a number of factors, another of which I'll throw out here. I know I've been going for a long time, so please forgive me. But the other one is we don't have a great sample size on him. So since we don't have a great sample size on him, this could go either way. He could get better or he could fall back off. But we only have like something around 20-something games or whatever to work off of. So everybody's guessing. 
It's just a matter of what you want to lean on when you decide to guess. Yeah, you said a lot right there. Um, at the beginning, I think you made a really good observation on how when we talk about hive mind, I, I think that's, a for me, a valuable description because Twitter does present sort of an emergent consensus among people in media. But it's also true to what you're saying that whatever your out group is, you have the perception of them having a consensus. And whatever your in group is, there you see subtleties and there you see nooks and crannies and slight differences. And it's funny, you see it in politics all the time where you go to either political party or even a libertarian convention, somebody with a very exotic politics. And if you go to that convention, they've got a bunch of different strains of the thing. Um, there's also something else where I think the priors when it comes to Purdy, college football fans, and you're a huge one, and I should have mentioned that one of the reasons I think you've been successful that people sometimes don't know because of the way you're exposed to people in media superficially is that you're a huge sports fan. And yes. that you like this is one of the reasons why I first came to your content uh, with the Morning Jones and was, you know, going jogging around Lake Merritt, listening to you cover everything. Um, you have this awareness and sort of profile on Purdy that I do not, I'm guessing in all likelihood, because I wasn't following Iowa state football at all. The first time I had ever heard of Brock Purdy, uh, was when he checked into the game against the dolphins. That was the <laughs> first right. time I had ever heard of the guy. And so I'm operating from the prior of, Oh, let's see. Oh, wow. This guy can play. Oh my God. Like, okay. Like this guy looks better than Jimmy G. Jeez. He's, he, he can really play. And so I think, I mean, I mean, I just love talking about quarterbacks. There are just so many ways uh, to do the job and so many different opinions that people can have. And my position on it is mostly what you see is what you get. I think we can overanalyze sometimes that we don't actually have a lot of examples of quarterbacks becoming dramatically different guys in different situations, especially on the positive end. We don't, maybe I put it out there on Twitter. We might have one guy a decade who looks bad in a situation, goes somewhere else and looks dramatically better. Right. Gino and so Smith, as an example, I mean, well, I'd have to go into G he might be the guy this decade. That yeah, he but that's what I'm saying. Like, like, like he, I think he's a good reflection of the points you're making. Not, not him yeah. as a, not him as a counterpoint, but him as a point to what yes. you're saying. Yes, and I mean, I drew off the example of my childhood that we could look at McCaffrey as an explanation of Purdy, but I grew up rooting for Ladanian Tomlinson, and it's not like Philip Rivers or Drew Brees' stats or production look so different. It might even look better post-Tomlinson. So I think there is something strange happening where this wasn't expected for a lot of people, and so instead of doing the what you see is what you get, uh, there's this urge to try to explain it. And what makes it further complicated is there is context. I don't think he's the best quarterback, even if he had the best stats this season. I would I would put him in that 5 to 10 range. But I think some people just go so far the other way, and some of that is informed by uh, four picks on Christmas and uh, all slipping around during the rain. And so yeah. that's become part of the conversation as well. So this is what I think is interesting about Purdy, because you're right, I do have greater context of him as a college player. And the thing about him in college is this is a – first team all power five player, right? He was the first team all big 12 quarterback and the big 12 typically has pretty damn good quarterbacks. So this is, he can play it's physical limitations that are his issue, but he's a baller. So like when people talk about him, like he's a game manager, I don't know when the hell somebody going to tell Brock Purdy that he's a game manager. That is not how he views himself at all. He sees himself as a dude that can come out here and make plays. And I think part of what is charming about him to watch is that he does go out there to make plays, right? What makes him more interesting and better than Jimmy Garoppolo is he's willing to take chances. And Jimmy Garoppolo was not willing to take. So he's that guy. He just doesn't have the biggest arm in the world and all of those things. But having a big arm matters. Like as much as we want to try to act like every individual snowflake is special, this game is largely about in in the playoffs that one that you saw where you got to drive that ball down the field in the rain, right? Like that's why the fact that Purdy did not have big hands, that was a demerit against him in the draft also, that matters because of how you're going to deal with a game like that, right? Where you need to be able to hold on to that ball and hum it down the field. Jordan Love, who has giant hands, you saw he could make throws 
that Brock Purdy simply could not make. Like, these are the reasons that you wind up with the skepticism over him. I also think that for what it's worth, and to be fair, if you bet against every quarterback, you'd win a lot more money than you would lose. Like, this is such a hard position to play. There are so few quarterbacks who are honestly good enough to be the quarterback on a Super Bowl winning team because you have to have so many different things lined up at the same time. Um, And so with Purdy, I think what can happen is you see people get ahead of themselves on guys like this. And the hey, all he does is win. Like it encourages it encourages a simple minded commentary that people who view themselves as more nuanced then get very frustrated with and then come behind and then criticize and then chastise or whatever it is. Truth is, at least as far as I stand with him, he has had a very good statistical season. There are probably 15 at least quarterbacks that I would take over him, right? But a lot of those quarterbacks that I would take over him. How dare you? Sorry. I, yeah, couldn't, yeah. I couldn't hold it back. I, it's just, it's just uh, in rate, but continue. Yes. Yeah, yeah. No, I take them over him, but I can't say that they played better than him this year. You know what I mean? Like, mm. I don't want to like, I don't want to take anything away from him. But did he did he play better than Trevor Lawrence this year? Yes. Do I think that the Jacksonville Jaguars would ever consider trading Trevor Lawrence for him? No. If I think they if they did, do I think somebody would get run out of town by the by the locals? Yes. Like even if they win a mm. Super Bowl, like, you know, I, I think I think that there's a lot that that gets conflated when we have these conversations about quarterbacks. And with him, it's like you have the stats, right? The team has the wins. And it's just like, why aren't you on board with it? And the answer from a lot of people like me is because, <laughs> you know, yeah. this, you know, so I get why it's unsatisfying on that end. Yeah. But I also feel like the people who are leaning on those things are not necessarily being sincere in their understanding as to why it might be difficult to buy in on what it is that he is doing. Yeah, I mean, the to what you're saying about most quarterbacks fail, the doubters are often validated. If we're talking about Nick Foles and Carson Wentz, the holdouts um, are often proven correct. It's a very hard position. Now, about the physical as- attributes, the the arm, I think his arm's fine at this point. I think it's, you know, it's not like, it's not a noodle. It's pretty good. And I do think the decision-making is paramount. And this is why... I might be more in agreement to some of your Josh Allen critiques. Um, And by the way, it's funny because you mentioned people hitting you up about, have you heard that, uh, that I say this or that somebody hit me up recently. Did you hear what Bomani Jones said about Josh Allen back in the day? And I said, I was covering basketball. I am not aware. (laughs) (laughs) I have no idea. Let me tell you, that is actually (laughs) some very interesting stuff. Cause I'll be very frank. What I said about Josh Allen, I said that Josh Allen was going to get everybody up there fired. (laughs) <laughs> like as yeah. soon as they took him i said he's going to get everybody fired and if you go back and look at those clips of him at wyoming and you go look and the fact that he never threw for like two thousand yards i don't think while he was there he had never made all conference he was the most wildly inaccurate quarterback that i'd ever seen in my life he is the one of one exception of a guy that used to not be accurate and so, and became fairly accurate. I've never seen anything like that before. I'll stand on everything I said about him his first two or three years. The reason it became so passionate, though, was, and this is with this weird thing where race comes into quarterback stuff, and I don't know why people just can't acknowledge the truth of it. They, we didn't have decades of all of this effort to stop black people from playing quarterback for that for all that stuff to go away all at once. Right. It doesn't it doesn't work that way. It only the perceptions like that about race only go away when people have a consensus belief that it's something white people can't do. Like we ain't going to have too many arguments about wide receivers for whatever reason. White people have decided white people can't do that. Don't even get me into talking about defensive backs. White people surrendered. They gave that up. They decided that they could they couldn't do that no more. And so they just let the black people have it. But quarterback. Hell no. Nah. They was not giving that one away, and they've done a lot over time to stop that. Well, if you look up, it's been a real revolution in terms of race at quarterback, and it's a testament positively that people don't really notice it, like the fact that three or four quarterbacks in the AFC uh, bracket at the end were black quarterbacks, for example, and I can make the argument that those four guys were the best quarterbacks in the league this year. That's not something that people talk about. There was a year a couple years ago where the top five offenses by DVOA, I want to say, had black quarterbacks. Like the black quarterback is common enough 
that people don't think of it by itself as being such a provocative notion. But what had happened was we stopped producing good white ones. Like between Aaron Rodgers and like Josh Allen, when you start looking year by year at who the good white quarterbacks were that were produced, there was a paradigm shift, I believe. And I believe that this is what happened is that playing quarterback Mm -hmm. required more athleticism and the paradigm had been established that the white dudes were slow. Like they weren't even looking for ones that could also move. They were just all slow. So you kept trying to bring in these statues from into a game that was destroying statues And then you can't figure out why you're getting your evaluations wrong. And so you look up and you just don't have the dudes. Like you had Matt Ryan and Joe Flacco came in in 08. You get like Sam Bradford in 2010, Matt Stafford in 09, but it took forever with Stafford. But you go through it and you see that's what happened. And then you look up and now it's a game that requires athleticism in a way that people have convinced themselves that white people are not capable of. And then Josh Allen arrives and Josh Allen arrives. The year after they tried, they ran Tyrod Taylor out of town in Buffalo, even though they went to the playoffs. They ran him onto the bench while they were having a season that was better than anybody expected to put Nathan Peterman in. And the Peterman threw, I want to say, four or five interceptions in the first half of that one game. And I couldn't figure out why it was that people were so goddamn excited about the Peterman. And they were so angry about Tyrod. And they were about to go to the playoffs for the first time in 19 years. You know what I mean? Like, like. You're not going to tell me that race didn't play a role in that because I've never heard of anything like that. There was no, wow, Tyrod, thanks for getting it done when nobody else has. It was consistently trying to get him off the job because he wasn't good enough. And then Josh Allen came in the next year. Their offense was no better with Josh Allen than it was with Tyrod Taylor, but the tenor around it was completely different. The year after that, they went to the playoffs. The offense was about the same, as I recall, by DVOA as it had been the year before. And Josh Allen had the brain meltdown of all meltdowns at the end of their playoff game against the Texans, where he was doing wild shit, like throwing the ball 50 yards down the field to a fullback. It was, I mean, you go Mm. back and find that game. It was wild, but people held out hope so bad. And so 2020 is when he started looking like that dude. He came out that year and he was good, but I'll never forget. It was late in the year and CBS was coming out of a break and they were talking about the games coming up and Boomer Esiason and says, it's Buffalo Bills and the great Josh Allen. The great Josh Allen. Come on, man. You know what I'm saying? Like, 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 what, like, what are we talking about here? What are we doing? And so there was this always this enthusiasm behind him that I always felt was actually unfair to him, right? Because I got mm. no beef with the dude. He got he has a, he seems to be a very nice young man. He is very entertaining to watch. But yeah, when he was throwing the ball over people's heads, I acted like he was a dude who threw the ball over people's heads. And when he stopped doing that, I stopped acting like he was doing it. What I can't figure out is why people, when he was throwing the ball over people's heads, acted like he was the same dude that he is right now. That And, and so when somebody's like, did you hear what Bomani used to say? Did you see what Josh Allen used to do? And they act like it never happened. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot right there. There's a lot right there. I'm, you know, he used to be far more inaccurate, number one. I think if you were running it by me back in the day, I would probably have projected him to be a bust just based on that. But I was covering the Golden State Warriors. I didn't know anything about any Josh Allen, so I didn't know. I've got nuanced opinions about him now. I probably think... I probably rate him lower than the consensus currently, which we can get into. Oh, and also, how dare you um, slight our glorious, gritty, white quarterback, Brock Purdy. That's the other thing I forgot <laughs> to say when responding to all of it. It's very mean. Um, yeah, with with Allen. So I, I, it seems like you're almost, you, you feel like a cohort was right about him, but for the wrong reasons. And I'm not really in a position to be able to know that one way or the other. But what I do see about him currently He's a fascinating guy to analyze. There's one narrative, and I think it's represented by Freddie's uh, Freddie's piece criticizing Nick Wright, uh, where circumstances have, have really failed Josh Allen, and it's a defensive-minded coach. You know, these were not optimal circumstances. He's gotten unlucky, and he's the guy who deserves credit for this team being repeatedly uh, relevant again and again and again. Um, when I watch him, obviously I see what everybody else sees and I see the tools that wow everybody else. 
Um, and his ability, it just seems like if he wants six yards on the ground, he can just take it. I mean, that's an amazing advantage. But he also just seems to lack a certain contextual awareness. Yes. And th- <laughs> th- th- this gets back to the quarterbacking conversation of what what do you need, right? Um, Tony Basati, a, a journalist out here on the West Coast, he, he, po- he posted Joe Montana's famous drive against the Bengals. And he made this observation about it, paraphrasing that, you know, none of these throws are all that amazing. It's just everybody doing their job. And it's just little chunk, little chunk, little chunk, little chunk, because that's what you need to do in that situation. I mean, that's nut cutting time. You know, this isn't you don't want to ask people to make really hard plays in that situation. So when I see people making I don't want to say making excuses for Josh Allen, but saying uh, Stefan Diggs dropped that 60 yard bomb. He dropped it. And I look at it and I go, it's fourth quarter. Seasons on the line, throwing a 60 yard bullet to a guy. It's not a blown coverage. He's covered. It's one on one, but he's covered. I mean, maybe they drew that up. Maybe that wasn't his choice to go that way. And if, if Diggs catches it, we say, oh, my God, what a play. But it seems like with Allen, there are a lot of those plays. I, I analogized it to he's almost the guy with the best golf swing that drags a driver onto the putting green. So it's hard to contextualize that for me or know how to rank that when a guy is so blessed and he's he really is great in so many ways. But when it comes to some of these situations where just a little bit would do, a little dab will do you, and it, it's like it's just overdone and we're trying to create highlights, and that's my perspective on him at least. No, I think that is a fair characterization of like, it's an experience, man. Like, you watch Josh Allen play, it's ups and downs. He does incredible, mind-blowing things. And he does all kinds of things like his mind is blown. Like, you're just like, I don't understand why you (laughs) thought that was the appropriate thing to do at that time, right? Like, for example, the 65-yard bomb. And Diggs is getting a bit of a bad rap on that, in part because he's just been so bad lately. But I think I saw Kurt Warner talking about it. Like, do you know how hard it is to track a football for 65 yards? In the cold? Yeah, yeah. Like, you think just because it just... The ball and the man wound up at the same place. One, it wasn't because Josh Allen's pass was perfectly on the money because Stephon Diggs had to slow up in order to get that. Like, there are a lot of moving parts that go on in a time like that. And so when I hear somebody like your man Freddie talking about how Josh Allen doesn't, you know, they're taking credit away from him and nobody talks about this and that, I've never seen anybody take any credit away from him. I think the discussion Mm -hmm. about Allen in public, at least the places where I participate in it, get down to a holistic understanding and appreciation of what he is and not ignoring the wild parts of the roller coaster ride when you talk about who or what he is. And so all this, everything that's going wrong around Josh Allen, no, I think they've actually done quite a decent job of putting things around him. I do think they ask him to do too much. I do think that he's in the Cam Newton place where they're just jumping on his Mm. back in large part in order to try to make things happen. I don't think that McDermott properly works around what they have there and understanding that this is just going to be a roller coaster ride. You can't simply ask this guy to minimize mistakes, but I also don't blame anybody for trying to get that guy to minimize mistakes. You know, like it, it, it goes together to me in that way. But I find that my frustration in talking about Josh Allen is I make critic I make what are legitimate criticisms of him, or in this case, not even criticisms of him, just pointing out that when you have a game where you're under five yards in attempts, you probably only played, but so well. And then I mm. look up and I hear people saying, I can't believe anybody's trying to blame Josh Allen because they lost the game. And I ain't heard a single person yet try to blame him for the fact that they mm. lost that game. Right. There's it a becomes, front lash. There's yeah. A front it becomes, lash. It's, there's, there's a measure of straw man construction that goes, which then makes it more fascinating to me to ask the question, Why are people so damn invested in Josh Allen in that way? Because you're right about the contextual understanding. It is a significant part of playing quarterback. It's one of the criticisms of Kyle Shanahan is he's almost too attuned to that in some ways. And that's how he winds up passing up scores at the end of the first half because he wants to make sure the other team doesn't get the ball, right? How you deal with moments in time and place matter a lot. And Josh Allen, this he ain't no thinking man's player, right? Like that's Mm. not, and, and by the way, this game ain't made for thinking. It's made for understanding and reacting, but it's not made for thinking. Like, I am a thinker. I am not a very good team sport athlete because I'd be out there thinking, and there's no time for that, all right? Like, you need to have such confidence in yourself and react. And when Josh Allen does that, sometimes it gets a little kooky, right? Yeah. And I think what your question is, 
Do you want to say that about your quarterback, that he's just a little kooky? And most <laughs> people would not. And I would, on the flip side, give some credit to Purdy, who, when the world's collapsing in on him, the season's about to end, he's about to be blamed, and it was chunk, chunk, chunk for the final drive with it all on the line. Now, some people would say, hey, the first three quarters. Some people would say, hey, the fourth quarter. I do think, I mean, I like these sort of unfalsifiable theories that we might have on why quarterbacks get criticized or not criticized. Um, the lack of criticism of love was interesting. And I was re-watching the end of the that game, and I feel like there are a lot of elements to that. If I wanted to get sort of um, sociological, cultural, I do think there's an element of Aaron Rodgers pissing off a lot of the media. Some some of that is ideological, political reasons, and some of that is just he's tiresome. Just he's like tiresome apolitically. And so there's this want for somebody to replace him, and we can kind of rub it in that they're better off with somebody. But these Jordan Love numbers, I know it's the past already, and it feels like it happened a month ago, but in the second half, he had 18 passes for 79 yards, and two brutal, just inexplicable interceptions. And it was odd coming off that game as a total Homer, uh, Brock Purdy apologist to see more, uh, you know, blame and criticism for Purdy than Love, who played, yes, the rain is a factor, but just one of the worst second halves I've seen a quarterback play in a, in a playoff game. Yeah, Jordan Love doesn't matter. Mm. Like I think I think that's where you and I were going back and forth about this a little bit is I don't think it's much larger than the fact that Jordan Love doesn't matter. Like, look, he looked bad early this year and collectively we all tapped out. We stopped paying attention to the Green Bay Packers, yeah. but we forgot, damn, they let anybody in the playoffs now. And so they got <laughs> in on that seventh seed. And you had to think about it again. And then you saw them against the Cowboys and he lit it up. Right. And then you yeah. go back and you hear people be like, well, actually, he's been very good for the last nine weeks. You just haven't been paying any attention. And you're right. We hadn't been paying a single bit of attention. <laughs> and so what I think you have there is a guy that, quite honestly, people didn't have many priors on to begin with. So they don't have a great investment in saying whether or not he is good or he is bad. Like he was the surprise first round pick. He sat on the bench for three years. I just don't think people have I don't think people got a lot of fight in them when it comes to him. And so he yeah. had a very good game in the playoffs, which I think right there exceeded the expectation. And nobody thinks that his bad performance at any level was going to be the reason why the Green Bay Packers did not win the Super Bowl. The question for the San Francisco 49ers all year has been, will quarterback play stop them from winning a Super Bowl? Now, as the year has gone on, there are more reasons to have questions about the 49ers. Their secondary is a little bit uh, porous shall we say, yeah. that becomes a reason to jump into this, the health of Debo Samuel, da, da, da. But nobody ever thought Jordan Love was going to be the fulcrum on which we, it is determined whether or not they go to a Super Bowl. And Purdy is, and so he invites a different measure of skepticism. And I also think that some of it carries over from the peculiar way that Shanahan dealt with Trey Lance and his mm. strange obsession with moderately talented quarterbacks. He would much rather a quarterback that isn't that talented. And I think they have to ask themselves the question, as good as he is at everything else, like if you want to win a Super Bowl, and look, maybe winning the Super Bowl is not the most important thing. And I don't say that snidely, right? Like maybe you'd rather just be consistently good every year. There's a value to that. But your head man not only can't do it with a talented quarterback, he breaks them. Mm. What, do you, right, so like, like, two, what do you do? Those are two those are two different ones. I, I agree with the second one emphatically. I think he puts his quarterbacks in danger, and he's got this old school mentality. Um, first one, I think he wanted Trey Lance to work out. I just think Trey Lance couldn't play. I think that was the issue. But, but he was uh, worse. Trey, but I feel very confident saying, just as was the case with Robert Griffin, Trey Lance was worse leaving Kyle Shanahan than he was when he got there. That might be so. I mean, he that's played, you talk about sm small sample size. I mean, Robert Griffin in college, that's a bigger sample size than what Trey Lance was doing yeah. at that at that small school. But, I might not know college football, but I know that much. But if he, A, number one, if he can't play, it's your job to get him to the place of playing. And number two, Kyle Shanahan had this bad habit with Trey Lance, the same one he had with Robert Griffin, of treating his quarterback like a running back, right? Mm. Those, go check that clip of Ryan Clark almost taking Robert Griffin's head off because Kyle Shanahan sent him on a go route. 
Yeah. Like at the height yeah. of Robert Griffin mania, like, why are you doing that? And with Trey Lance, why are you running power with him over and over again? This doesn't make any, like these things don't make any no. sense. Kyle's a weirdo, man. He just like, yeah. I don't, I, and I think it's fair to ask if he breaks these guys. Well, he looks at them as chess pieces as opposed to human beings. I think there's an argument for that. And um, he's not necessarily focused on it. He doesn't accept any blame or responsibility for why these quarterbacks keep getting broken under him. But that is the question. If you see the press conferences with him, they just get completely under uh, under his skin more than any other. One quick note on this whole conversation, and we'll try to rush towards the finish line, rush through our progressions because you've got a hard out. <laughs> um, I think one of the reasons the conversation sometimes is how it is about these things is actually the broadcasters have a big influence on what we talk about. I think that's so underrated. When you get into these situations where 30 to 50 million people are watching, because I was wondering why the conversation was what it was, and then I rewatched the game, and I could feel the purdy doubt, and this isn't a criticism, I just think, I don't think Olsen, Greg Olson's a purdy hater, but I could just feel like the doubt, and at one point he says on the final drive that this is his chance to prove that he's an NFL quarterback, which is just so patronizing. <laughs> an NFL and, uh, quarterback. An NFL quarterback. I think he meant to say playoff, but that's what he said, and... With Love, because Love's progression had been different where he looked really solid at the beginning, there was a lot of, oh, look at this young man, look at this, look at that. And so it's like there was this narrative of, oh, my God, it's really falling apart for Purdy. And then he all he just saves it, and it just happens so quick. And you are you would think that you would go with the recency bias, but in a weird way, you've kind of been taken on the narrative journey of this guy is totally out of sorts. And the collapse of love happens so fast, and the whatever the inverse of a collapse uh, for Purdy, it, you know that happens so fast that it was like there wasn't a lot of scaffolding in in the mind. Or am I just getting too thinky about the whole thing? No, I think the broadcast team matters a lot, and I think that people need to think about like how a broadcast is set up. And I mean, I worked at ESPN for a long time, but I've never been involved in this end of the business. So what I'm talking about here is just really my own observations for watching these games over the series, uh, you know, over the course of my life. And they're setting up story, right? Like this yeah. is, you, you're setting up an accompanying narrative to get people into the game. And also keep in mind that unlike the San Francisco 49ers, the Green Bay Packers are a national brand, at least in the ways that I in the way that I think of them. Mm. If I had to guess, if you asked me which team had more fans watching that game, I would guess it would be the Green Bay Packers. Like even the 49ers, who have not been the wow. only team in their own home market for the majority of their existence. Like I would bet in America uh. there are more Packers fans than there are 49ers fans. I don't know if I disagree with you on that, but I disagree with you on the idea that the Niners aren't a public team. I think the Niners are one of these teams like the Cowboys and Packers where, I mean, Jamel Hill is a Niners fan. She didn't grow yeah, up but in that's San she from, But that's because she's from Detroit, right? Like she bailed on the <laughs> local losers and got on the hottest thing that was going at the time. And maybe some people did that, but the 49ers are not. They're not the Steelers, right? The Steelers, I think, are the the, hmm. the better example of this national brand. I think the Raiders are more of a public brand than the 49ers Whoa. are. The wow. Raiders, dude, it doesn't even matter what city the Raiders play in. You know what I mean? Like they're just they just got something. They have yeah. a, I, even if there may be more 49ers fans, but it's a different type of thing with the Raiders. Hmm. Um, but with that being said. They're setting that up with, hey, the rise of Jordan Love. There is no controversy around him yes. as a story in the in narrative construction. But with Purdy, there is. And the narrative of him is the question is whether or not you can win a Super Bowl with this guy. That's the question. And yeah. so that's going to permeate throughout that broadcast. I don't think those guys are sitting there looking at the card to remember the script or anything no. like that. But I do think it's going to affect the way that they talk. I do imagine there's somebody in their ear every now and then telling them, to rem hey, don't forget about this. Hey, don't forget about that or whatever it is. And so, no, I think what you're talking about does matter. And the way the broadcasters talk does guide what happens on the shows the next day. The same way the way people talk about stuff on ESPN establishes and dictates the conversational agenda um, that we wind up having. I wound up hitting you up about Jordan Love just because I was just like, I don't think people got no opinions about him. I just don't think yeah. that he's become that broad of a topic yet, in spite of my argument of the Packers as national brand. Yeah, people don't have a strong Jordan Love opinion. Right now, he's sort of this weird placeholder where, 
I think people like trolling Rogers with his success, but he has not been a character on the TV show for a long enough time for people to have opinions about himself. Okay, so let's just hit some quick topics in the you know home stretch of this whole thing. Um, and what I like about having Bomani on, I feel like it's like a car we can drive anywhere. You know, I'm, I'm almost <laughs> confident I can just throw anything at you. It's like uh, on a game show, it's a vacation to anywhere. But uh, this whole Doc Rivers situation, Bomani. Woo! Uh, <laughs> Doc Rivers, uh, you know, ESPN it broke up their broadcast with Jeff Van Gundy and Mark Jackson, fired them effectively, uh, bring in Doris Burke uh, or, you know, uh, promote her and then bring in Doc Rivers. Uh, and now Doc Rivers apparently is going to be coach of the Milwaukee Bucks. Uh, their coach, Adrian Griffin, people say he was in over his head, even if they were winning, he's out. What takes do you have on this? First of all, I did a Gilbert and Rena's podcast last week, and I had made the point, and they agreed with me. Um, nobody knows when it's over quite like the roster of an NBA basketball team. When mm. those guys say it's over, it's not just over because they said it's over. It's over because yeah. they know it's over, right? Yes. Like it's not. I mean, people think of it as like, like look at them as like mutineers in those situations. But very often they're just observers with the keenest eye, and they're just like, "Hey, man, this." Yeah. They, they know what a coach looks like, and they know when they don't have one. And they seem yeah. those players seem to say that they didn't have one. And once the ones that matter go ahead and say it, like when people talk about Magic Johnson being a coach killer, and it's like, no, he's just the one who said it. Right. Like mm. when the one guy says it, it's because the whole team been saying it. And then it's just, you know, me and the fellows was over here talking and we just think we need some changes. And then it's going to wind up being some changes. What I find so funny about this is they as Adrian Griffin to, you know, work with Doc Rivers as a consultant. The team wanted him to do that. And Adrian Griffin, it's Philadelphia Eagles, <laughs> yeah, Philadelphia he, Eagles situation. He should have never taken a single one of Doc Rivers phone calls because it was over at that point. And here's here's the reason. Doc Rivers is not re- was not retired. He just wasn't yeah. coaching no more. He wanted to coach. He was not like I'm out of the business. There's no way that you could trust anything Doc Rivers told you cuz Doc Rivers wanted your job cuz Doc Rivers wants a job, let it's alone amazing. a job with Giannis and Dane. Hell yeah, he wants that job. And so what do you yeah. know? Now he's got that job and which of us knows or thinks that Doc Rivers is the guy in 2024? To get you to a championship. Which of us thinks that? Uh, I mean, this might be the roster to do it, but he does have a little bit of Kyle Shanahan, strange contextual decisions. It almost seems like, this is a weird thing to say about a coach, it almost seems like he wants it too bad. Like yeah. there's like this weird kind of desperation. Maybe I'm reading into his raspy voice. Um, it's like a salesman who overtalks the sale. Uh, Gil from the Simpsons comes to mind, who I think might've been based on that character from Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross uh, that Jack Lemon played. But there's just this, I, I don't know. It's like doc is kind of a famous choker. There's no other way to say it. It's just what's been happening. Um, yeah, but and I try, other- and, and I can point out each of those individual three ones, for example. And yeah. I think I think the Clippers ones, the the Clippers Nuggets one is the only one where I'm like, yo, I don't I don't have anything <laughs> for you on this. Yeah. Like others, I could point to whatever it is, but it sure seemed to keep happening to you. Like you know the people that just always got bad luck, <laughs> right? Like wow, your house burned yeah. down twice. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's the thing where we can come up with an explanation. We can say it's this and it's that, but it just keeps happening. Now, the other perspective, the other perspective is that Adrian Griffin was not competent. And just by inviting a guy in, I mean, everybody would say that Doc Rivers is a good coach. A lot of what the Warriors ended up doing offensively was stuff that Doc did. And I I once asked him about that and how weird that was to see so much of his offense implemented by the Warriors. I'm trying to remember what the coaching tree explanation for that was. And I'm trying to build oh, yeah. Adams. Eh, it wasn't Ron Adams. God, this is now just killing me. Who was with doc who installed what the Warriors did, who was on their staff. Anyway, we don't need to explain this. And I just remember that to be. So I remember that to be the case. Um, so there's something to it, but it is funny. Alvin Gentry. Thank you, Anthony. God, I loved Alvin. Alvin was just the funniest, just the funniest guy. Um, I remember when he was looking for jobs and the Sacramento Kings, Vivek was telling them to try to play four on five and, and cherry pick. (laughs) And I said to Alvin, we were at a shoot around. I go, 
Well, it seems like for that job, you might need to play four on five, Alvin, you know, like, uh, would you be willing to play four on five? And Alvin looks at me and he just goes for three years, 15 million shit. I'll play three on five. (laughs) (laughs) Hey man, we all got a boss. I love that guy. Um, but yes, I think basketball wise, it's probably the correct decision It's probably the best they could do with this particular juncture. But to what you were saying to have doc as a consultant who wanted the job. I mean, NBA, NBA is a brutal world. NBA is game of Thrones. It is vicious behind the scenes. I said on my podcast, doc walk in like, what's your first suggestion? Holla at your boy. <laughs> That's my first <laughs> suggestion. That's the, the let me tell you how you turn this thing around. You're oh looking at him, baby. You're looking at him. He pulled the Dick Cheney. He pulled the oh, who should be vice president? Well, let's see. Uh, oh, it, me. That's who should do it. And, uh, it. That's that's the guy right there. <laughs> the, way, the way I said it on pod, I was like, he went to the owners, and they were like, yo, give us a list of all the things that you should do to fix this. I mean, he tells us all the things <laughs> you should do, and he gave him this whole list. And then he goes to Adrian Griffin. He says, look, man. They asked me to give them a whole list of things to do. And, you know, I, I'm trying to get this money, you know. So I told them that, like, you know, I gave them the list. But this is what I'm going to tell you. You stay true to what you're doing. They'll come around. They'll listen to you. You do You do what you need to do. And everything to goes, Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't, let these, you, can't let the, you can't let them move you off your square. You do what you're supposed to do, and everything going to be right. And then just sit back and wait. That's oh, all you got to do. Because, look, man, they clearly going to give you the job. Right. They got a coach and they came to ask you what the coach should be doing. You the coach. You go be the coach. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but I think a lot of that and this is maybe we're going to end on. Is this an inflection point for Giannis and the media coverage? He's been this kind of cuddly guy, this persona. He's won a championship, but. I mean, he got Bud out of there. Like, let's not mince words about it. He's talking He's talking to the media saying that there's no such thing as failure while well, he's shit-canning his coach. So, obviously, there is such a thing as failure. He, I think the assumption is that Adrian Griffin was hired because that's what Giannis wanted, and now he's out of there. Are we going to cover Giannis different, or is the NBA just in this weird place right now where everything just feels kind of loosey-goosey and Greg Popovich can win, uh, you know, 15 games for the rest of his career and nobody cares. Well, that one, I mean, you could go with that know. one. You could take that yeah, one. Either that way, one. dealer's choice. I mean, that one, out. I mean, that one for me is just like, with Popovich, you're just not going to tell me that the plan is to be as bad as they are. Like, forget about year no. by year. They might be the worst team in the NBA this year, and that's indefensible. Like, if you've been working on this for four years, you didn't know you were going to get hit, right? So if you had not gotten him, what was this going to be this year? Were you going to be even worse than this? Like, how in the world yeah. are you so bad? Um, but I do think with Giannis, it's good for him. He's already gotten that ring. Yeah. You know, oh, like yeah. once you yeah, once you get that, but now Magic Johnson had two rings. I mean, he had a ring, and then he got Paul Westhead out of there, and he still took the brunt of what that was to me as someone who has had to get somebody fired before, it doesn't feel good. Right. Like Mm -hmm. I actually look at the NBA player with you. Just, I don't think they get enough credit for the courage that it takes to go stand up and be like, Hey guys, y'all, y'all gotta get this. Like, I, yeah, I mean, he, Mm -hmm. I like him too, but y'all gotta get this dude out of here. Like, you know, maybe you get a guy like Jason Kidd who seems to live for that sort of thing, but (laughs) you know, most people don't want to do that. And so for yeah. Giannis, I'm not inclined to be the one to judge him. But at the same time, I'm right there with you. It's a good thing he got that ring because we look at those shortcomings that the Bucks had up to this point as boot and holes are shortcomings and not his. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's something to that. I think boot and is one of these guys who, and I, I'm not getting deep into it, but there has been criticism of how he coaches in the playoffs, how he is slow to adjust, how to bring it back around. He goes in with his priors. Yes. And maybe he doesn't really adjust them uh, as he should. Uh, I think we made it, Bomani. I think we got in before your your heart out right there. We did. I think we, we we touched on the Popovich. You touched on that. I think it is weird that we're just kind of, because he's so accomplished, uh, I guess we're just going to let him coach the team terribly in perpetuity. <laughs> and uh, we, we, you know, we uh, addressed the whole Giannis and crazy situation. We didn't talk about the broadcasting, but that's fine. That will shape up however <laughs> it shapes up. Do you have anything for us to plug on this outro, sir? 
No, just check out The Right Time with Bomani Jones. We're doing some things on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? My bosses seem to care about YouTube. Go ahead and highlight us uh, over there. I might have some news for you later this week. I can't tell you right now, but mm-hmm. I just might. But I'm going to let you know. Okay. I uh, would endorse that. And uh, hey, we're going to try to do YouTube as well. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Thanks so much, Bomani. Always a pleasure. Hey, man. Appreciate you.